All right, good Monday afternoon. It is that time of day when you and I gather around a crispy fire. Well, maybe not a crispy fire. How about just a fire where we can cook some s'mores or cuddle up and just be warm in this kind of weather? Better than snow, though, huh? All right. Third day of May in the Lord's year 2021. It's 1 o'clock, and I'm J. Michael McCoy, and this is webcast1live.com and KPOG 102.9 FM, Grimes, West Des Moines. So I uh, uh, I want to talk a little uh, about forgiveness today. And uh, this may not be the perkiest. That's a word, isn't it? Perkiest. This may not be the perkiest message you've heard. But I ask that you give me a little time to work into it. Because just like a molten lava cake, sometimes you have to get all the way to the core to eat the yummy on the outside. It's no secret for anyone who knows me or goes to church with me or works with me or whatever that when Jesus got a hold of me, and it'll be 11 years ago, geez, 11 years ago here in a couple months, I was not capable of forgiving someone, including the biggest resentment in my life, was simply to forgive myself. And it's way too long of a trail to try to unravel on the radio. Uh, it's outlined in my second book, Living Free Through Forgiveness. And I'll be more than happy to give you one. I, I'm not trying to sell books. But to get me to where Jesus finally got my attention was a long and tedious journey. And many, many times, my unforgiveness, my inability to forgive, would deliver me to the torturers. T-O-R-T-U-R-E-R-S. Torturers. And no, I'm not talking about people who torture with guns and knives and sticks and all that. I'm talking about the demons that live within all of us. Oh, Mac, Mac, it's Monday. Can we please not go down the, the road of spiritual warfare and, and demons? And come on, let's talk about something fun. Well, I can't think of much fun or something that would be more fun than being able to, oh, in about 56 minutes, get something solved between your ears. Will you walk that trail with me for just a little bit, please? See, I don't believe it's any accident that when the disciples asked Jesus, how do we pray? I don't know how to pray. And Jesus recited for the first time, but not the last, what we now call the Lord's Prayer. You know, I grew up with Catholicism, and so the Lord's Prayer was literally a part of every church service that I went to. In fact, it's so grained within me that I can probably just say it by heart, frontwards and backwards, and upside down and right side up. And I never really understood, like most things that are theological, I never really understood what Jesus was trying to teach us. It just seemed like another creed, another prayer, something else that we would recite, <clears throat> and that would make up our church services. Because that's what a church service was if you grew up Catholicism. It was a grand entrance with music played on a pipe organ. It was um, uh, 
beautiful, beautiful adornings, adornings, clothing, outer, um, outer garments such as for a priest or a lay person or a disciple. And the music would fill the church. Whether it was big or small, the music always filled the church. And at front, there was an altar. An altar where the local priest would preside over some blessings on you and on me. Eventually to wash his hands of our sin. And then deliver to us communion. uh, Unleavened bread. Wine. Sometimes it's just a chunk off a loaf of Wonder Bread and some Welch's grape juice. And it doesn't matter what it is. What matters is what it means to you. For some reason, I, you know, we, what did I start taking communion at age eight or nine? Something like that. I don't know. For some reason, it was always the most reverent thing I seemed to do. Like most people, when I got out of church, I was a rotten son of a gun for another six days and 23 hours. And only was I on my best behavior for God when I was inside those hallowed halls, the stained glass windows that were 10, 15, 20 foot tall, the different stations of the cross represented in stained glass windows on, on the back of the church and, and, and the, the timber that took the tower up, 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 up with a bell that would ring right when church was going to start. I didn't understand forgiveness. I knew what the word was. Father, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Did you understand it? I didn't. I didn't really know it at all. It was just a cantation. That's a big word for me on Monday. It was just part of what we spoke. I mean, I've I've got it memorized. Uh, Probably not as well as I used to, but I had it memorized. And forgiveness was... I don't know. It's It was something that it seemed to get shoved under the rug. Like it was much too difficult to accomplish by ourselves. And as Jesus said on the cross that night in Calvary, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I want you to think about that for a minute, will you? Can we just unpack that for a minute? Father, Papa, Holy One, Creator of everything, please forgive our trespasses. Forgive our sins. Forgive our uh, uh, bad actions towards other people. Forgive our trespasses but only in the manner in which we forgive those that trespass against us. See, that was, that was Jesus slipping a little something kind of fancy on you right there. I didn't catch it. I didn't catch it for probably 50 years. Seriously. Forgiveness was, you know, forgive this day our daily bread. And, and it was just part of the cantation. It was part of the prayer. Until I hit a brick wall in my life. Horrible, horrible, horrible time. And I needed to forgive a group of people because I couldn't get rid of the pain by myself. So someone near and dear to me said, well, you you need to ask forgiveness for what you are guilty of. 
And then, Mac, when you speak of the person or the individuals which were your, were, were your torturers, you need to pray that they're happy, loved. They get everything they want, everything they pray for. Peace, solidarity. And that was hard because that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to scream and yell at the top of my lungs, who do you think you are hurting me the way you are? But see, I wasn't talking to the right person. I was talking to the one who hurt me. I should have been talking to the one that could heal me. Because that's, that's the cantation we need to know. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Do the people in your lives that hurt you actually know what they're doing by doing what they're doing to hurt you? If your answer is yes, then your unforgiveness for that individual needs to be much, much larger. It's got to be one of the hardest things you've ever had to do. Because quite frankly, my flesh would just as soon get a tire iron out. But that doesn't work. See, the torturer, the devil, Satan, Jezebel, would only use that to shame me even more. Let me tell you what I mean by the torturer. And that's not a term that I use very often, but it's a term I have begun to use and place in the midst of my prayers. Not for the torturers to leave me alone and quit torturing me, but for those who can't forgive, let the torturers not eat their flesh alive. Don't leave them with this ugly, ugly taste in their mouth that they can't get rid of. Because unforgiveness is kind of like that. It's that taste in the back of your mouth. I love garlic. But boy, it doesn't love me after it's been sitting there for a while. I love nice, nice corn on the cob. But if I'm not kind to myself, all those little kernels will end up between my teeth and then my dentist will be ringing me up and saying, I had a little birdie tell me you need to come see me. See, the torturers can only torture you if you let them in. You are a child of God. You have been created by the the master, no one, no one can break the bond that you have with Christ unless you want to challenge it with the torturer. You know, when Jesus and Satan were standing on top of the mountain, and Satan said, I'll give you all of this. The world is yours if you just bow down and glory me, glorify me, worship me. And you know what Jesus said? One of my favorite lines. This kingdom is not of my world. This kingdom that you want to give me, O torturer, O Satan, O Jezebel, you want to give me something that's not yours to give away. You can't take what I don't have. But the torturer seems to think he can scare us. And the truth is, he can. Sleepless nights. Addictions. Time spent unwisely chasing a rabbit down a rabbit trail that will only end up in a dead end. As we study this torturer and 
the unforgiveness that it brings to us. <clears throat> I want to read something from a resource. And it's uh, uh, Bruce Wilkerson. And it was Bruce Wilkinson. I got, I'm sorry, it's Wilkin. W-I-L-K-I-N-S-O-N. And it was uh, Bruce Wilkinson and uh, John Eldridge who probably came together to teach me how vital of a tool forgiveness can be. I want to say that again. Teach me how vital a tool of forgiveness can be. As we continue today, we're going to reflect on on a side of forgiveness that is greatly misunderstood or completely overlooked altogether. This all-important aspect of forgiveness is the single reason why Jesus commands us to forgive those who sin against us. How many times? Seventy times seven. What you will discover in going through and shedding great light on why you suffer when we fail to forgive, you will be empowered. You will be greatly blessed. You will be so empowered that you'll never have to do the shuffle again. You'll never have to suffer again. You'll never have to try to outdance the devil in the pale moonlight. I just had to add that because I'm a bad man freak. You will be empowered so that you will never have to suffer again needlessly from the sin. Oh, the sin of unforgiveness. Another sin I've got to deal with. I thought I had them all wrapped up pretty well, but now we've got another one. Because no matter what someone says or does to you or me, it is a sin to not grant them forgiveness. But God, look what he did to me. Look look, look how he betrayed me. Look how he abandoned me. Father, certainly you don't want me to go so low that I have to look at him eyeball to eyeball and belly to belly and say, I forgive you. Why, why, why would I need to do that? Me and God, we're fine. We're like this. Jesus and me, we've been groovy for about 10 years. And the Holy Spirit... Holy Toledo. He's just showing up every time I turn around. But why must I forgive someone who tortured me? Tortured me to the depths that I couldn't handle it anymore. I used to say, I've got one nerve left and you're on it. Let me give you an idea, if I can, something that I'm going to call a brilliant idea. I'm not complimenting myself here. No, no. I want you to see this within you so you can see the path that you can take, that you can take to grant forgiveness to yourself. Let's go to scripture, Matthew 18, 21, 22. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus said to Peter, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. You know, it's a rare occasion when you have the opportunity to ask a question and receive a life-changing answer. 
an answer so brilliant and powerful that it holds the key to your personal well-being, your relationship with others, and your relationship with your Papa God. In the verses above, Peter asked Jesus a question that has probably crossed your mind a time or two or three or 9,972. How many times should I forgive a person when they deeply wound me? And I want you to think about the difference here between a, a, a wound and a hurt. A wound can go all the way through you. A wound gets into parts of your your body and your mind that you never, ever, ever would have exposed to someone who claimed they loved you. You don't get hurt by people who love you or you love them. And then they turn around and do that horrible, 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 abandonment and betrayal. And see, that's when we go from you hurt my feelings to you wounded me deeply. And by saying you hurt my feelings, may I, may I just suggest for a moment, please, may I? What you're really doing there is a tit for tat. You're saying, well, you did this to me and it hurt me, so I'm gonna do this to you so it hurts you. Jesus didn't talk about that at all. It's not the answer he gave Peter. The wound is what we want to heal. It's the wounds caused by the betrayal of someone that you trusted. Do you have wounds from people who betrayed you? Yeah, you do. You don't want to talk about them. You don't want them to rise to the top. In fact, right now, you may be saying, uh, sh sh shut off the radio. I don't want to hear him talking about wounds. And, and, and the fact that if I don't forgive somebody, it's a sin against me. Are you trying to tell me, Jesus, that if I don't forgive people who have wounded me, I'm sinning against you? Wow, 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 wow. I had no idea our relationship would go that heavy. Is that what a relationship with Jesus is like? It's not a nonchalant stroll down Raccoon River Lane. It is an in-depth, horribly painful opening of the wound so all of it can be exposed to others. As I started to say in the verses above, Peter asked Jesus a question that has probably crossed your mind a time or two. How many times should I forgive a person when they hurt or deeply wound me? Remember, when you tell someone, well, you hurt me, you're showing them that you chose to be offended. Don't choose to be offended. The only person it hurts is the, uh, you. It doesn't hurt anybody else. You're just, you're just giving up the secret that, yes, you offended me. But wound, that's not a word you should take lightly. A wound can be deadly. A wound can change your heart and your body for long periods of time. How many times should I forgive a person? That's a great question, Jesus said. Don't you think? Who wants to subject themselves to someone who continually mistreats them? Well, the answer should be nobody. But it's strange, it's strange who we lie with in our beds. And I don't mean that physically. 
I mean, we give someone the power. Emotionally, we give them the power to just pour salt in that wound and drag it up where everybody can see it, and it just hurts. It hurts so bad, and it isn't a physical hurt. It's a betrayal. Now, if for some reason you listening to this for the last 25 minutes says, I, I can't relate, Mac. I, I, I can't relate to somebody wounding me the way you said they do. I am incredibly blessed to have you in my life. I need you to teach me. How do you overlook or forgive those wounds? Most of the time, it's through a horrible way. Drugs, alcohol, anger, pity party. But to really feel that wound that Christ offers us. I mean, look at him on the cross. He died on that cross so you can forgive somebody. Now, there's a... Here's a trick for you. Mac, are you telling me that, that, that Jesus died on the cross so I, I would realize the, the, the wounds and, and the pain that we, we feel through unforgiveness and, and all the sin that can pile up on us over and over and over and over can be simply removed and erased and buried with Christ's son Calvary? Yeah, I think so. Who wants to subject themselves to someone who continually mistreats them? Nobody. This is the reason why Peter, in the same breath, offers Jesus a seemingly very generous cutoff point seven times. You know, if we're honest, most of us think forgiving someone seven times is still too far and excessive. That's, I love, that's, that's a great line right there. What, seven times? Oh, I can barely get out one. Maybe if I put them into pairs, I get two. But triplets? Quads? Come on. I've said I'm sorry. I've asked him forgiveness. I, in my heart, have forgiven him. Kind of. And I want to be done with it. And Jesus says, that's not the way you heal these wounds. To be done with it. This isn't something you, you, you get a Kleenex and you clean up the doggy's poo-poo on the floor and just get rid of it, throw it away. This is a wound. This is not a, a pain in your side. This is not an itch of your eye or a pebble in your shoe. This is a wound. You gave someone permission to be a deep, deep part of your life. And they decided to use it against you. And not just hurt you, but wound you, take you out, leaving you like roadkill on the side of Grand Avenue. If we're going to be honest... The reason why Peter, in the same breath, offers Jesus a seemingly various cutoff point seven times. If we are honest, most of us think forgiving someone seven times is far, far too excessive. And quite frankly, way above me. He doesn't, she doesn't, they don't deserve that level of forgiveness. Well, is it okay I tell you something you don't want to hear? Don't stick your fingers in your ears and go, la, 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 la. You need to hear this. Because you have sinned against God. And you expect the almighty creator to forgive you. Well, the truth is in the pudding. 
If you really, 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 really want God to forgive you, show him that he's taught you how to do it. Step up. Come out of your shell. Don't hide behind your fears. Don't, don't, don't hide behind your hurts or your anger. Step up. Name the sin. Name the wound. Put it out in front for everyone to see that you have repented and that that person no longer has the power over you to take you out like they want to. The pain we feel even from one wound causes our heart to scream, once is enough! Knowing our human limitations and our natural inclination to protect our hearts from pain, why would Jesus tell us to forgive our offender 70 times 70? We're going to talk about that over the course of the next few weeks. You'll learn Christ's shocking revelation that will unlock your freedom to forgive. Did you hear that? Nobody's going to ring your doorbell and give you $5,000 a week for the rest of your life. No, this will be this will be priceless. Something you can't buy. Not quite how much money you have. How much influence you have. You will learn Christ's shocking revelation that will unlock your freedom to forgive. See, forgiving our brothers or sisters 70 times 7 is not a forgiveness quota we are trying to fulfill, but a new way of life. You heard that, didn't you? Did you get a little smile on your face? Because you can remember that moment that you suffered and suffered and swore you'd never forgive that person ever as long as you live, and then you find yourself praying for them to be happy, released. You see, a way of life that keeps our hearts whole, our relationship with others peaceful, and our walk with God joyful, choosing to forgive 70 times 7 ensures us that when we will never allow a trace of unforgiveness, to live in our hearts ever again. Did you hear that? You see, choosing to forgive 70 times 7 ensures you that we will never allow a trace of unforgiveness to live in our hearts. And that is peace. Thank you, Jesus, for such a brilliant idea. Unlimited forgiveness. Would you say that you have adopted Jesus' brilliant idea of forgiving everyone for everything as a way of life for you? If not, what do you think is preventing you from doing that? See, God desires that we forgive like he does. I don't know if this is true or not, but I'd, I'd, I'd take a stab at it. I'm not sure he understands why we can't forgive like he does. I mean, doesn't he have the right to stomp his feet and say, hey, you're telling me that what, what, what this person did to you and you filed back at him is, is, is worse and they shouldn't receive forgiveness? You shouldn't receive forgiveness? God says, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Paul's letters to the Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 32. God has forgiven us for everything through his son, Jesus Christ. Why do you think, now listen to this, why do you think you and I are tempted at times to be selected forgivers? 
How then can reflecting on God's forgiveness towards us help us to forgive others? We're going to talk about that for a few days. And what I need you to do is to bring out that wound and attach it to the person who gave it to you so we can together, 70 times 7, forgive the individual for the wound. Think of all the wounds that Jesus had on the cross. Every time he was whipped, every time his, the thorns would cut into his crown, can you imagine having your hands nailed to a cross? Those are wounds. And every one of those darn wounds came from you, from me, from us. He died to take away our sins. And God says to not forgive is sinful. Can you just settle on that for a minute? I, I just want you to wrap your arms around that because that's something else. He forgave you. He didn't make you run a mile. He didn't make you grovel. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Isn't it time you show somebody that you can forgive the way God forgives you? Pretty powerful. So over the next few days, weeks, you don't have to say it out loud. But I want you to remember the wound that still isn't healed. I want you to try to remember many of the things that were said or done to hurt you so deeply that sometimes it's easier just to forgive and forget than to live through it again. But you see, when you forgive someone else to that extreme, to that power, something you never thought you'd be able to forgive before. I think that makes God smile. He, he's teaching you. He, he, he's teaching you to be humble, to be teachable. And we need to put him up where, where we can see him and talk to him and listen to him. Walk through this exercise that every time we talk about the torturers, you know who I'm speaking of. Every time we talk about the sin of unforgiveness, you, you'll know. You're going to have to decide whether living with that sin is easier than living with forgiveness. You must hate to lose more than you hate the daily discipline that it takes to win. You must hate to lose the battle of unforgiveness more than it takes to never forgive or forgive or forgive. To hold it out there like a carrot, like a big sign, neon sign, blinking, blinking, blinking. Never going to forget that person, never. Let you and I work on that. How about that? Amen? Amen. Frank's walked into the studio, and he wants me to turn on the mic. Hello, Frank. Hello. Let me share with you something out of uh, Christ's Objects Lessons. Peter came to Christ with a question. How oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times? The rabbis limited the exercise of forgiveness to three offenses. Mm. Peter, carrying out, as he supposed, the teaching of Christ, thought to extend it to seven a number signifying perfection. But Christ taught there was never that we are to never become weary of forgiving, not until seven times, he said, but until 70 times seven. And this is based on the parable of the guy that came, and he um, owed an immense sum of money, 10,000 talents, and he had nothing to pay, and according to the custom, the king ordered him to be sold with all he had that payment might be made. But the terrified man fell at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. 
Then the Lord of the servant was moved with compassion, loosed him, and forgave him the debt. But now this same servant turns around and goes out and finds one of his fellow servants, which only owed him a hundred pants, laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me now what you owe me. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went away and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when the fellow servants saw what he had done, they were very sorry and came unto him and told their Lord what was done. Then the Lord said after he called him, O wicked servant, I forgave thee all thy debt because thou desirest me to. Shouldest thou not have compassion on your fellow servant as I had pity on you? And the Lord was wrought and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. Kind of hits home, doesn't it? Tormentors delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due. The parable presents details which are needed for the filling out of the picture, but which have no counterpart in spiritual significance. The attention should be diverted, should not be diverted to them. Certain great truths are illustrated, and to these our thoughts should be given. So the when you say we're, we're not forgiven because we forgive, we're forgiven as we forgive. And that's something that I don't think most people realize is that we're, our forgiveness is going to be weighed out and measured out in our own scales. Do you, do you, do you think we will stand, and I mean you and I, do you think we'll stand before God and he will list our sins when it comes to unforgiveness? Or will Jesus just look at him and said, Pop, he's good, he's with me? Well, if we're saved, our sins won't be itemized. They'll be put on Satan. But we will want to know why the people that aren't in heaven weren't there and will be shown in probably great detail why they're not there and why they couldn't come because they had this unforgiving spirit. And then the wicked later on will be judged, and they will bow a knee and acknowledge God to be just. Even in their punishment, they, they will agree that he's just. See, what, what you just said, you just nailed my wound to the tree. Because I know to truly forgive, I have to want to see them in heaven. Yes, it sh- you should, you, if, if Christ died for them, he created them, he loves them, he died for them, if you're going to be like Christ, even though it goes against your nature, you're going to have to love them also and forgive them as Christ forgave them. And if you have this unforgiving spirit and can't forgive them, then in essence, you're canceling out your own forgiveness because we're taught to, to forgive us our sins as we forgive our debtors. As we forgive, we're forgiven. And we come each day for a daily dose. We don't get no dose of grace for tomorrow. We don't get no dose of grace or forgiveness for tomorrow. We come to Christ daily and say, give us our daily bread, our daily forgiveness, our daily grace. And as we for, and as forgive me today as I forgive others today. And it's a day-by-day walk with the Lord. And just as you got to eat today, what you ate yesterday doesn't count what, when you're hungry today. And so... No, no, that's not true. I have humps on my back. I can, <laughs> I can store the water and the food. Well, that's what my friend used to tell me is I, I, he thought I was a camel because I where did I put all the food and I didn't eat for a couple of days and then I just ate and ate and ate. But yes, uh, we come daily for our dose of grace, our dose of forgiveness. And as we extend that forgiveness to others, we're forgiven by God. But we will be well. See, you'll probably remember. Do Your dad ran a mercantile or some kind of a store, didn't he? Yeah. Well, when the, you know, the unsavory guys who might weigh your beef on their scale. Okay. You get, say you want a five-pound chuck roast. But what you're not noticing is when the guy throws the chuck roast on the scale, he's got his thumb on it kind of pressing down. It weighs out at six and a half pounds. Uh You don't know that. 
you you are going to be weighed in the metering and the gauge of your own scale. So if you're shortchanging people on your scale, that's the scale you're going to be weighed in. And that is what we're going to talk about for the next few days and maybe even a couple of weeks. It's time to use this pandemic, this time living outside of ourselves, not being able to do what we always do. It's time to create a new for you. And I don't think it's losing weight. I don't think it's getting that tattoo you've always wanted. I think it is genuinely pulling the torturers out and forgiving them and learning to do that. And we're going to do that right here. Amen. Amen. I'm J. Michael McCoy. If I haven't told you lately, I love my job and I couldn't do it without you. Right here on webcast1live.com and KPOG 102.9 FM. On the throne of the world empire of the Medes and Persians, a 